Starship is once again seen spinning in the sky. And like many others, you're probably asking the same questions. Why is this happening? And more importantly, how can it be fixed? So we'll break it down today. All right, let's start with that venting we saw about five minutes into the flight. A lot of people assumed it was a leak, but it might have actually been something planned. Before launch, SpaceX mentioned a few upgrades to help prevent the kind of engine issues they ran into during Flight 8. These included adding extra preload to key joints in the upper stage engines, a new nitrogen purge system, and some tweaks to the propellant drain setup. The nitrogen purge system is essentially a fire suppression measure. It flushes the area with nitrogen gas, which is non-flammable. This helps displace any oxygen or methane that could accumulate in confined areas like the attic section and potentially ignite. After that, there looked to be a hot spot on one of the Raptor vacuum engines region manifolds again. This was kind of scary because Flight 8 had some similar problems too, but this time it didn't seem to cause any issues. So, if these systems were in place, what exactly caused the failure? Well, Elon Musk mentioned that leaks caused loss of main tank pressure during the coast and re-entry phase. Lots of good data to review, but it actually seems like the leak issue had been going on for quite a while during the flight. Right after the second engine cutoff, you can see the ship start to spin a little. Then, a bit later, we get a view inside the payload bay where the Starlink dummy payload was sitting. Now, seeing ice particles floating around in there is pretty normal. That's just vented cryogenic propellant freezing in space. But what stood out was that the ice particles all seemed to be drifting in the same direction, almost like they were following the rotation of the spacecraft. That's not typical, and it could be a clue that something was off. So typically, when a spacecraft starts spinning out of control or acting weird, you'd fire thrusters to correct its attitude, right? That's the usual approach, but SpaceX does things a bit differently with Starship. Instead of using traditional cold gas thrusters, Starship relies on olage gas for attitude control. That's the gas in the empty space above the liquid propellant in the tanks. As the engines burn fuel, that space grows, and to keep the tanks pressurized, you have to fill it with gas. Starship does this by boiling off some of the cryogenic propellants and re-injecting it as a high-pressure gas. This keeps the fuel stable and flowing correctly. And that pressurized gas can also be used for controlling the vehicle's orientation. But in this case, because there was a leak, the tank couldn't build up enough pressure. And without that pressure, the attitude control system, basically the gas jets, can't function properly. So the vehicle loses its ability to steer during coast and re-entry. Some believe that the leak occurred because Starship still inherited design flaws from Flight 7. These flaws may still be present in Flight 35, just mitigated rather than fully resolved. The sound of another propellant leak suggests that while the mitigations may have prevented an explosion, they weren't enough to save the mission if the leak was caused by the same harmonic issue. Another important question to ask is, why would the payload bay door fail to open? After all, if SpaceX can build state-of-the-art, full-flow staged combustion cycle engines, how could something as seemingly simple as a sliding door go wrong? Well, believe it or not, opening a cargo bay door in space is more challenging than it might seem. Doors in space are surprisingly tricky. They must function reliably without compromising the structural integrity of the vehicle, all while withstanding extreme temperatures, both scorching hot and freezing cold. That means dealing with significant thermal expansion and contraction, which can easily affect how moving parts behave. Materials don't act the same way in space as they do on Earth. A massive metal structure that was assembled under Earth's gravity might subtly change shape once it's in orbit. Components relax or rebound into slightly different positions once the stress of gravity is removed. If this isn't perfectly accounted for, metal parts that once had clearance may end up pressed tightly together, seizing up and preventing movement. To add to the complexity, the vehicle was leaking fuel, remember? If any of that leaking fluid made its way into the payload bay, it could have altered the pressure balance or caused unexpected mechanical resistance, further interfering with the door's operation. 
There's also the issue of vacuum welding, or cold welding, an often overlooked hazard in space. This is the unintended bonding of metallic surfaces that occurs when they come into contact in a vacuum. In Earth's atmosphere, a thin layer of oxidation usually prevents metal parts from fusing together. But in space, clean metal surfaces can bond spontaneously, especially under pressure or vibration. This phenomenon has caused real problems in the past. A classic example is the Galileo spacecraft. Launched on October 9, 1989, it was meant to gather data about Jupiter. But after 18 months in space, three of its 18 high-gain antenna ribs failed to deploy. Engineers later concluded that they had cold welded together, likely due to metal-on-metal -metal contact under pressure in the absence of atmospheric gases. Despite their relative motion, the parts had fused, demonstrating that cold welding can occur alongside fretting and galling. Now, Starship is built from stainless steel, which is less prone to cold welding than softer metals like aluminum. Still, this is spaceflight, and everything must be considered. So, it's not entirely surprising if Starship's payload door failed to open on the first try. Even NASA's space shuttle had a familiarization guide for its bay doors that was over 90 pages long, dense, technical, and detailed. Designing sealed, pressurized, reclosable, autonomous space-rated structural doors that can survive the launch environment is no small task. Now, after knowing all this, what are the solutions? So first off, this latest issue might finally make SpaceX rethink using an attitude control system that depends on main tank pressure. Sure, it's a cleaner design and simplifies things, but when you get a leak, like what happened this time, it becomes a big problem. The bigger the leak, the faster the drop in tank pressure, and the worse the RCS performs. And from what we've seen, it looks like there's no backup system in place. That's not great. A redundant RCS really seems necessary at this point. Now, if you're not familiar with RCS, it stands for Reaction Control System. It's basically a set of small thrusters that help a spacecraft steer, adjusting its orientation, or even moving it slightly in different directions. These thrusters can control roll, pitch, and yaw, and spacecraft usually use a mix of big and small thrusters, depending on how precise they need to be. But RCS isn't the only way to handle attitude control. There's also something called a reaction wheel. This is a really cool system that doesn't use fuel or thrusters at all. It's an electric motor with a flywheel, and by spinning the wheel faster or slower, the spacecraft rotates in the opposite direction. It's all based on conservation of angular momentum. Reaction wheels are especially useful when you need really fine control, like pointing a telescope at a star and keeping it locked there. For example, the James Webb Space Telescope uses six of them, built by Rockwell Collins Deutschland, to help it maintain super steady orientation in space. So yes, while using tank pressure for the RCS might seem like a clever idea, it definitely has some serious downsides when things go wrong. And sure, adding more backup reaction control systems might seem like it goes against the whole the best part is no part philosophy. But the most important thing is having a ship that actually works. Once that's in place, then you can start simplifying from there. SpaceX could also improve the flight algorithms and control authority so that Starship can reorient itself using only aerodynamic surfaces if it loses attitude control and starts re-entry in a random orientation. Basically, if Starship starts acting unpredictably, almost like an out-of-control aircraft, it could still interact with the atmosphere and use forces like lift and drag to stabilize itself. The flaps could be used to generate the control needed to bring it back into a proper re-entry attitude. If it's true that the leak was still caused by the same harmonic issue that hasn't been fully resolved, then a long-term solution might be switching to Raptor 3 engines. Raptor 3 was designed specifically to eliminate the need for a traditional heat shield around the engine section that not only saves a lot of mass at the base of the vehicle, but also improves reliability. According to Elon Musk, if a small fuel leak happens with Raptor 3, the leaking fuel would just burn off harmlessly in the surrounding plasma during flight. 
that makes it much less of a concern. On the other hand, when engines are enclosed inside a sealed compartment, any leak becomes way more dangerous because the fuel can build up in a confined space. As for the payload bay issue, I guess SpaceX just needs to do more testing to see how the door holds up under different loading conditions. Some observers believe that SpaceX may be experiencing what's known as the second system effect, also called second system syndrome. This phenomenon describes how a team's second attempt at a system following a successful first version is often plagued by over-engineering and complexity. The root causes are typically inflated expectations and a sense of overconfidence. In the case of the Starship program, version 1 was designed with humility. The engineers recognized the limits of their knowledge, so they kept the design simple, included large safety margins, and avoided unnecessary features. As a result, it worked well. Encouraged by that success, the team approached version 2 with greater confidence. They began adding in features they had previously left out, reducing margins and increasing complexity. However, they may not understand the system as thoroughly as they believe. This overconfidence can lead to an unreliable and failure-prone second version, an outcome consistent with what we have seen so far. But on the bright side, while the various failures are understandably disappointing, they also highlight just how far ahead SpaceX is pushing the boundaries of spaceflight. For example, the booster failed during its landing attempt on its second mission, something no other company has even reached, as most never attempt a second flight with the same hardware. The failure of the payload bay door is only relevant because SpaceX is attempting to reuse the second stage something no one else is even trying. Similarly, the second stage failed after payload deployment, a phase most companies disregard entirely because their upper stages are discarded. Even the absence of re-entry testing is notable not because it's a lapse, but because no one else is attempting re-entry at all. In this light, these setbacks underscore the ambitious goals SpaceX is pursuing rather than simply reflecting technical shortcomings. More importantly, Elon has finally decided to step away from politics. With the return of the boss himself, I hope SpaceX regains momentum and moves in a more focused and efficient direction. If you have watched this far, I truly appreciate your time and interest. I am glad to know that this video has been helpful to you. We are on our way to reaching our goal of 10,000 subscribers, so feel free to support us by hitting that subscribe button. It really helps a lot. Thank you.